Hinduism has had a major impact on religious beliefs in the Western world over the past half century. So much so, in fact, that Newsweek magazine recently featured an article entitled, We Are All Hindus Now. What do they mean by that assertion? Is there any truth to it? And why do Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism seem to be growing in popularity? For the viewpoint of an expert on Eastern religions, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I are delighted to have as our special guest this week a wonderful Christian lady by the name of Carol Matriciana. Carol, welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Thank you so much. I love much that for smile. <laughs> and I appreciate you flying all the way out here from California. Uh, what e a flight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I understand you got fogged in and. Uh, Flights had to be changed and all that. But I'm here. You're here, yes. I, I don't think the devil wanted us to make these uh, programs, and I think our viewers will understand why when we get into it. Yeah. I'm excited about getting into it. Well, uh, folks, Carol is a best selling author and filmmaker and is a recognized expert on Eastern religions, contemporary cults, paganism, and the occult. She has been involved in the production of more than 60 documentaries over the past 30 years. Her autobiography, published in 1985, was titled Gods of the New Age. It became an instant bestseller. It was republished in a revised edition in 2008 under the title Out of India. In 2002, she won the National Religious Broadcasters Award of TV Producer of the Year for her video about the Harry Potter novels. Uh, the clever title of the video was Harry Potter Witchcraft Repackage Making Evil Look Innocent. Some of her more recent video productions have been one in 2007 titled uh, Gods of Inter Entertainment. It was about the power of the mass media to influence and corrupt the values of society. In 2008, she released a hard hitting video called Yoga Uncoiled, in which she exposed the dangers of yoga and debunked the popular idea that there can be such a thing as Christian yoga. In 2009, she produced another very hard hitting video entitled Islam Rising, in which she clearly demonstrated that Islam is anything but a so called religion of peace. She is currently putting the final touches on a new video production to be called Wide is the Gate. It is an expose concerning the apostate emergent church movement that is sweeping through evangelical Christianity today. Carol, tell us about uh, how you became an expert on Hinduism. Well, I wish I could take credit for it, but actually I was fifth generation born in India. Wow. So it was my environment, it was my personal experience. Uh, I was born in Calcutta, India. Calcutta is named after the goddess, the black goddess Kali, who has her mm -hmm. tongue sticking out. She has the 29 heads of her husbands who she has slaughtered and killed because she desires blood. So Kali Ghat, the steps of Calcutta, the steps to Kali, was the city that I was born in. And uh, I saw firsthand incredible worship to Kali, the goddess Durga, uh, Shiva. He is the consort who has the serpent wrapped mm -hmm. around his neck, serpent around his arms, serpent around his legs, so that whatever he's thinking, the serpent is thinking it for him, whatever he's doing with the serpent around his arms, uh, wherever he goes with the serpent around his legs. So serpent power is integral in Hinduism. Actually, in all Eastern mysticism, the serpent is raised as a um, being of power, knowledge, and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so I had this, um, as a child growing up, realized the power and the adoration of everyone around me for this sort of so-called white incredible wisdom. And yet, as a little child, I was uh, I, I could feel the spiritual fear somehow. I can't explain it. It was just always um, an ongoing dichotomy. Well, well, now tell us more about your background. Uh, uh, you were born of British parents. I was born of British parents. My father was in the British military, and my great grandfather before him in diplomatic now, was, service. Were you brought up in a Christian home? Actually, I was raised a Roman Catholic. Okay. Uh, fifth generation Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and a very devout one. Very devout. Because in India, uh, and, and because of my father's devoutness, um, my life was orchestrated by Jesuit priests and by nuns who they uh, advised my father as to which schools I should go to. Um, and so even when I was sent to boarding school later on in my life in England, it was under uh, the protection of the nuns, the convent, the Sacred Heart Convent, that they had decided and put together. So and, and so were you introduced to principles of Hinduism by anyone? Well, you know, uh, interestingly, in every country that Roman Catholicism is, it takes on the culture yes, of the country. Mm -hmm. So in India, uh, uh, Roman Catholicism is actually deeply influenced by Hindu mysticism. So it was a very easy step for me uh, after I left school, um, about 17, 18, being introduced in those days, London, I had just come to London, we, we'd left our parents, my parents had left India, we came to England in the late 60s where swinging London, the Beatles were in there, the hair, the, the uh, theatre show was absolute number one swinging hit. And um, I remember the promotion of Hinduism and yoga had been completely repackaged for the West. The Hare Krishna devotees were going down the uh, London streets, uh, Oxford Street, in their orange garb, crashing their cymbals, Hari, 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 Rama, Rama, Rama. And I used to remember, I heard this as a child in India, but it was much darker. It was sort of blacker. It hadn't been repackaged for the Western mind, the way that Hinduism came through the Beatles, through Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, through Transcendental Meditation, through the celebrities, so that when the celebrities talked about Eastern meditation, Eastern mysticism, yoga, it came packaged with celebrity status. Mm -hmm. And it was very appealing as we were young people growing up in our 17, 18, 19, 20s, seeing our superstars turning to drugs and Eastern mysticism, of course we wanted to be involved too. Well, in your book, uh, a wonderful book which we're going to tell our viewers more about uh, later on called uh, Out of India. Uh, in this book, one of the things that uh, really stands out is uh, you tell about when you got to London and you were 20 years old, I think this was in 1966, that you went to see a musical and that it was like a life transforming event, a spiritual event. What was the musical? Yes, it was hair. It was hair. <laughs> and it was transforming. And you thought you had found the truth. Well, yes. And, and really, what was incredible about that was that it was the manipulative way that music had now come into that generation. Of course, now it's in this generation who are consumed with music and the powers of music. But music was the conduit to take you into spiritual realms. And without even realizing the spiritual realms that I was being taken into was this polished Hinduism and yoga yes. that I had just come out of. But in <laughs> India, you could see it, it the way, you know, there are hundreds of idols, thousands of idols in the trees, in the monkey god, in the, in the elephant god, in the cow in the middle of the street, which your car is not permitted to move if a cow is in the middle of the street because that is God. Sacred so you cow, can't. Huh? That's yeah, where I got the term? A sacred cow, holy cow. <laughs> you cannot move the cow. The, the, the deity of the street at that moment can hold up your meetings, but you cannot kick that thing out because you can't kick God. But you see, it's not only the cow. Every animal, every living thing is divinity. The trees, the, the rats. There are yes. rat temples. There's a rat temple, yes. Snake temples. So um, the idea of being one with divinity is part of Hinduism. And yet in Roman Catholicism, I, I was raised with the idea that Jesus Christ on the cross was sort of a divinity I couldn't reach because I had to go through Mary and I had to go through prayers and burning candles and had to go through mass and through benediction and my daily devotionals. And so it was a God that wasn't reachable, but in Hinduism, everything is divine. And so the conflict and, uh, is huge. I'm going to come back to a point you just made. You, uh, you inferred that the Beatles were very important in packaging Eastern religion to be acceptable in the West. Develop that. 
Well, the Beatles, of course, were out of England, North England group, young kids played, the, played their band uh, in the garage in the in Liverpool, the Liverpool <laughs> accent, the, 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 the original garage band, yes, discovered um, by Radio Luxembourg, promoted by uh, English titles that then suddenly swept across to America. But they seemed so innocent at first, and then what, what well, happened they, they to were, them? They were sweet little love songs. I think the point is that they got rich very quickly yeah. from, from a garage in Liverpool to suddenly having mm. adulation worldwide can go to one's More head. famous than Jesus, John Lennon John said. John Lennon said that. <laughs> that was his quote. And I think what happens is that the... And, and I know from my personal experience, because I very quickly in the swinging 60s rose to being a top model and went from England to America. When you get fame and money so quickly, um, life becomes kind of empty because you have no value on the richness that you've acquired so quickly. And, and then you start looking for spiritual things. But the spirituality that was around in those days was Eastern mysticism because the, these gurus from the East were flooding yes. into... And they came a, under their influence. And everybody became under their influence. In, in fact, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi did an incredible marketing ploy. He used the Beatles and all the Hollywood celebrities that were involved and flew them out free to Rishikesh, which is the northern part of India where the goddess flows with all her energies and powers out of Rishikesh to the whole of India. So here you've now got the indoctrination of these celebrities who are trendsetters for the world, and they're being filmed all the time so that when they came back to the West, they came indoctrinated. In fact, they, they put were... out a new album, Sergeant Pepper's Band, I believe it was called, in which they had an album cover where they were standing in front of a grave for the Beatles. It was a symbolic of we are burying the old Beatles yeah. and we're becoming the new ones and we are very much involved in Eastern religion. And every one of their songs, I, as you got more and more involved in the lyrics of their songs, because they started off as sort of sweet little love songs. Yes. Yeah. And then as you got involved in their lyrics, through the transformation of lyrics, and music, we became Eastern devotees, whether we liked it or not, whether we even understood it. Imagine, I am you, you are me, he is she. These are all words in the songs, which is that God is everywhere, we are all divine. Okay, you start out as a Roman Catholic in uh, India, mainly going through the motions, not having a real personal relationship with God, but doing all the things that you do there. And then you get involved in this new form of uh, Eastern religion brought in to uh, the West, and you get all caught up in the hippie movement and that sort of thing. Where did you meet the Lord? Well, <laughs> interesting. You see, that was pre-New Age. After, uh, after that, it, this thing got called the New Age, and this New Age spirituality is not, has crept into the whole of society now. But in those days, because you were on a mystical search, a spiritual search, even if it was for Jesus, it was still called a, a mystical spiritual Search. I mean, nobody differentiated between the two because Jesus was one and one and all. And it was actually on a modeling job in Chicago um, that I, through a, another two models that were on the job, it was a wonderful story. I've written it in my book. Yeah. It's a little too complicated to get into in full. But the point was, I was taken to the back room. They invited you to a Bible study, well, right? I didn't know it. <laughs> if, I had, no, if I had known, if I had known it was Bible study, I promise I wouldn't have gone because I did not. I thought Jesus was very narrow-minded because in my new age yeah. uh, embrace of everything. Jesus was too narrow. The Bible was too narrow. Christians were hypocrites and bigots. I was by this time a complete lover of peace into the environment, a vegetarian, a feminist. Um, I, I, I did yoga. I, 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 I contacted the spirit world. I was gung-ho for the new age. And these friends invited me to um, a party in downtown old Chicago. And uh, I thought there were going to be drugs there. I didn't realize that I had gone into a Christian bookstore because the Lord had so blinded my eyes. I was raised in, I, I'd, I'd done graphic design. I was an art student, but my eyes could not see all the graphic <laughs> images because you'll know, you'll know when I came out why. But I went into the back room where I thought everybody was passing around drugs because this was such a happy group of people. They were all <laughs> smiling and they were at peace. And I wanted to see where the joint was and there was nothing there. <laughs> but I saw this man, this young bohemian sort of hippie, reading from a well-worn book 
in the corner. And he was reading and everyone was listening. And slowly I started realizing he was talking about God. That tuned me in. That God works in the environment that you're in. That tuned me in. So I came off the idea of looking for where the drugs were passing mm -hmm. and realized something incredible about the authority of this man. I didn't know what it was, but he spoke with an authority. And afterwards they prayed and their prayers were very personal. I remember thinking that because I had been raised on the rosary mm -hmm. and um, wrote prayers, sort of uh, repetitive prayers. And this was very free for all praying. And I was so touched by that, I went to him afterwards and I said, you know, thank you very much for, for this. And he said, how long have you been a Christian? And I said, all my life. Oh, oh you did. That was your answer. That was my answer, all. Yeah. all my life. Because, and that's the confusion today. A lot of people who aren't Christians think they are, but I truly believed I was a Christian. So I said, all my life. Here I was doing yoga, <laughs> contacting spirits, involved in spiritism. I, I was involved in every occult, uh, satanic possibility that I could have been involved in in, the, in that era of my life. So he asked one other question which completely changed my life. When did you accept Jesus Christ into your life? Wow. I'd, I'd never been asked that question. I didn't yeah. know. I didn't know that. And I think he felt me stumbling yeah. and he came in right there with a 12-minute gospel which is the power of God unto salvation. 12 minutes. He had me riveted. I was focused. I realized that there was somebody that died for me, that loved me so much wow. that he died for me. I had, no, I had a lot of boyfriends by that time. <laughs> Model, <laughs> All of, of course. them told yeah. me that they yeah. loved me, but none of them would have died for me, I promise you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and just to know that somebody died for me, it totally changed wow. my life. And he Love said, would you, would you like to... Um, accept Jesus Christ into your life right now, of course. I mean, how could you deny inviting somebody that loves you so much that he gave his life for you? And at that moment, it was almost like a vacuum cleaner came into my life. Every one of my transgressions was wiped away. I was slated clean. I walked out of that little room at the back and the room that was in the front was a Christian bookstore with hundreds of books all about Your Jesus. eyes were open now, you could see that. Yeah. I thought, how did I get in here realizing? Spiritually blind, huh? It was incredible. Yeah. What a story. Well, we're going to take a break for just a moment, and we'll come back and talk about the impact of Hinduism on the West. Welcome back to our interview of Carol Matriciano. We have been talking about her a journey from Hinduism to paganism to Christianity. Carol, I want to thank you for the testimony you just shared with us. Man, I was tingling all over and wanted to stand up and shout hallelujah and everything else. It's, it was great. It's one thing to read about in your book, it's another thing to hear you tell about it. Going into a place looking for drugs and coming out with Jesus Christ. Well, I mean, that, that is really something. Uh, I tell you what, I, I would like for you to just tell our viewers how they can get in touch with you, get on your newsletter mailing list. So, would you just look in that camera and tell them? Well, thank you so much. Yes, actually, you can just go to my name. It's spelled differently C A R Y L. So, it's www. C A R Y L T V dot com, Carril TV dot com. And uh, you can subscribe. We have a free newsletter that comes out very regularly on contemporary issues, how the New Age movement and uh, all the new nuances and the new spirituality are coming into our churches and into Christianity. And um, thank you. And okay, they, you know, Carol. And all the movies. Oh. You get a, our 10 minute trailer and uh, well. you have a preview of all the movies that we've okay. made. Okay. Now, Carol, uh, I want to uh, talk with you for just a moment about the impact of Hinduism on the uh, Western uh, world and also on Christianity. And I'd like to do it by quoting to you from a Newsweek magazine article that I just thought was phenomenal. The article was entitled, We Are All Hindus Now. And it said, America is not a Christian nation. We are, it is true, a nation founded by Christians. And according to a 2008 survey, 76% of Americans continue to identify themselves as Christian. But according to a 2008 Pew Forum survey, 65% of Americans believe that many religions lead to eternal life. 
including 37 percent of white evangelicals, the group that's most likely to believe that salvation is by Jesus only. Also, the number of people who seek spiritual truth outside the church is growing. The 30 percent of Americans call themselves spiritual and not religious, according to a 2009 Newsweek poll. And that's up 24 percent since 2005. Stephen Prothrow, a religion professor at Boston University, has long framed the American propensity for the divine Delhi cafeteria religion as very much in the spirit of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Well, as I, I told you earlier, I thought myself a Christian. And yet here I was involved in all of these new age, new spirituality, pagan, occult, Hindu, Eastern mystical uh, practices, and yet truly, truly believed I was a Christian. So I can see where a huge percentage of people would answer that kind of a survey saying, yes, I'm a Christian. But do they actually understand biblical Christianity? That's Most are difference. probably what you would call cultural Christians, just born into a Christian society, go to church, but no, never really know the Lord. No, and that's, that's the danger because we're all born with a vacuum inside yes. of us to know God. And if society, through the celebrities, through our movie stars who are turning towards Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, even our, our Christians from the pulpit that are, uh, are speculating, not even speculating recently, Rick Warren was right on there inviting his three expert guests who are all involved in Eastern mysticism, Hinduism, transcendental meditation to come onto the screen. And so if you've got a pastor like Rick telling the people to um, follow their health and well-being program and you think here's a Christian telling me to do things, you don't realize that all of this is becoming confused and enmeshed in our Christian culture, in our Christian churches that are embracing Eastern mystical ideas. How do we identify that then? I mean, you, you grow up in Hinduism, you've lived through Hinduism in an American type and British setting, but for the rest of us who, who believe that we're in a Christian nation or even maybe a post-Christian nation, how can we identify that Hinduism has reached into the United States and where is or it taking Or even our church. That's yeah. a great question and you know there's only one way. That is to really know your Bible. Hmm. See, it was the first time that evening when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ that I went on a crash course because they told me, have you got a Bible? I said, no, Bible. I, a Christian all <laughs> my life. Didn't that, right? I didn't know I needed a Bible. <laughs> I read the Bible from cover to cover in those six weeks five times. Wow. Because that I had a, a hunger. When you give your life to something, you really give your life. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly realize you've been missing the bread of life, the water of life, the food of life, Filling and, and you just, it, desire, it suddenly right? filled it up. So I think the way that you can really tell a transformed Christian is if they have a love of the Word, a love of the truth, and then they're filled with the Holy Spirit that then applies that truth to, in answer to your question, to be able to discern what is evil and what is good. Because you can work out from that survey, for instance, it talked about that, uh, that many Christians believe that there are many paths to eternal life. Not true. Mm -hmm. If you know the Bible, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You get abundant life through me. I introduce you to the Father. You can only come to the Father But you see, our major me. value today, Carol, in American society seems to be tolerance. And that is so intolerant to say Jesus is the only way. Yes, because that's part of Hinduism. You see, Hinduism is all embracing. Yes. It's, it believes that all paths lead to God, that you can have your truth, you can have your truth, we can all have our truth, and let's have unity. And you can have the elephant God, and I can have the rat God. And yes. Why is that? I mean, what is their view of God then? Well, God is a consciousness, and it's a consciousness that you have to connect to mystically. That's what yoga was designed for. Yoga is the only path into changing your mind, your consciousness, to go within yourself to arouse the snake, which is believed to be inside of you, and then connect to God consciousness, which is a force, and then you realize your divinity. In, in Eastern mysticism, there is no such thing as sin. It's your ignorance that you are divine. So yoga and every mystical practice is to connect you with your divinity, which will then connect you with the whole embracing universe. Reminds me of Shirley MacLaine in her uh, uh, books talking about, if you really want to find God, you must go inward. 
you must go like in. we have the answers? Well, I, and look what the Bible says. <laughs> Jeremiah 17 yeah. says there's no good thing within us. Jesus no. says that what comes out of our mouth is what defiles us. Yes. So to go in, which is what I had been doing through Eastern mysticism, you get confused, you get lost, you, you start living subjectively. Volitional processes take over emotions become your truth. Well, I feel that's truthful. I feel that's truthful. But when I got redirected back to the Bible, I could then go to my objective truth and say, well, what does God say about that? Is that, it, can I have eternal life? Do all paths lead to God? Are we all divine? Can we all become one with everything? So it has to be the Bible that becomes our yardstick. And I tragically believe that hundreds of thousands of Christians in America go to church on Sundays but do not read the Bible. Mm -hmm. They have maybe a little Bible verse thrown up on a, a screen, multiple screens up there on PowerPoints and stuff like that, but they do not go and check what they're being taught against the Bible. In Acts, Paul said that the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians because they searched the Scriptures daily and checked them against what How much more should they check you and me? Uh, <laughs> they should check me 100%. <laughs> what are some other things about Hinduism that you could just definitely point out so we can say, hey, you know, let's stay away from that? I think anything that makes you rely on your emotions and your feelings and well, your that's experiences. Very postmodern emergent church. Isn't that it? is. You okay. see, they're, they're, the, the whole belief is that nothing is, uh, truth is not absolute, that we can oh, yes. all find our own truth. Mm. And so when you have that coming into postmodern thinking, into the seminaries, into Christians that are being trained to be pastors, then they go out onto the pulpit and say, um, well, whatever you all believe is okay. I want to be politically correct. I don't want to offend anybody. You're not all sinners, which of course is what Hinduism teaches, but that isn't what the Bible teaches. So if your pastor comes in and says, uh, we're going to have a lesson this morning on uh, what uh, homosexuality, for example, and instead of saying what the Bible says, says, how do you feel about this? Let's, let's talk about how you feel about it. You're really off on the wrong track. You're wrong. You're and it's, well, in Hinduism, homosexuality is embraced. In fact, homosexuality is part of religianity or mysticism. Or Carol, I'm sorry to say our time is up. I wish we could keep going on and on, but we're going to have to bring this to a close. Would you be willing to come back next week and talk with us about, quote, Christian yoga. I'd love to. Thank you. Well, very, we very would much love to have you do it. I know you're a real expert on it, so thank you, and uh, we look forward to having you back. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll be back next week when uh, Carol will be talking about Christian yoga. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. The book, Out of India, is a true story of the New Age movement. Carol Matriciana was born and raised as devout Catholic in India, where she was surrounded by Hinduism with its mysticism, yoga practices, belief in reincarnation, and the divinity of all. She writes about her confusing childhood experiences, witnessing India's caste system and animal worship. As a young adult now living in the West, she became involved in the hippie movement of the 60s, where she unwittingly embraced Hinduism as it was repackaged and called the New Age. She tells the captivating story of her personal spiritual struggle through a maze of contradictory beliefs until she finds truth and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Out of India traces the roots of the New Age emerging spirituality, which is shaping business, medicine, education, and government. Sadly, it is also seducing millions of Christians away from the truth of biblical Christianity. To get your copy of Out of India for a gift of $15 plus shipping, go to lamblion.com or call the number you see on the screen. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.